I'm so thankful for John. I was standing, talking, and writing people's names down in the back of my Bible, and he said, how exactly were you going to open the service this evening? I said, I'm supposed to do that tonight? He said, yes. I said, oh, I'm so glad, because I would have been standing there wondering who was late. And so uh, that, that is really a blessing. It reminds me of yesterday we went to see the apples. I didn't even know they had apples over at the Gull Lake Farm. And we went over to see the apples and the pumpkins and all that. And it was crowded and all the arrows where you had to park. And we got out of the car and the whole gang of us were walking in that big barn thing and smelling all the donuts and everything. And we were three steps inside when we were immediately surrounded. It was like a security cordon around us. And they said, do you feel like you're at Van Buren Beach? We're all from the church, and we found you. And it was wonderful. We met all these families, and they said, did it make you feel bad? I said, no, because I'm wearing my clothes this time. And so I said, you can visit all you want. And so it was really great. And, uh, and so we slipped out of there and went to Aldi's. You know, they only have one here, and we found it. We got our cart. Someone came up right behind us and said, you found Aldi's? And I said, yes. So do you know what? I, what I've concluded is there are saints from this fellowship everywhere in southwestern Michigan. Can you imagine the outreach that the Lord wants us to do? Uh, in fact, I, I was talking to someone. I pulled out my wallet and pulled out a track, and they said, where did you get those? And I, I thought, I don't even know if we have track racks here. I should be careful about telling you to get a track rack track of a, off the track rack if we don't have them. But tracks are they're just little gospel presentations that when you talk to someone, you leave behind. It's kind of the way that, that they keep uh, with the message you're giving. So I'll have to check into that. I shouldn't advertise something we don't have, but we'll work on it. But let's open our Bibles to Matthew 24. We're backing through. We're going through the seven big events that are on God's calendar, the seven final events through the end of time as we know it. And, and we started at the end of them and, and have backed progressively up. We're at the fourth one, which is the second coming of Christ. And what I'd like to to lodge in your mind this evening is that the second coming of Christ is for a reason that often we don't think about. We just think it's happening. But in Matthew 24 and verses 21 and 22, we see this fourth event as as part of a, of a bigger plan that God has and, and for a reason that sometimes we don't think about. Because the second coming of Christ is the single greatest visible expression of God's power to the entire earth since he flooded the planet. Now, when you think about the flood of Noah, that was a big display of power because everyone except Noah, his wife, and his three sons and their wives, every other human being perished as they saw the demonstration of God's power. And, and so this is the second uh, most visible expression of God's power. And it's... it's tied to the tribulation. And Matthew 24 tells us that the reason Jesus comes when he does is to cut short the tribulation. If he did not come when he came, or when he's going to come, if he did not come at that moment, there wouldn't be any people left. You understand that's what Jesus said. If I didn't cut this thing short, no one would survive. That's an amazing thing to think about. It's only happened one other time. That, that almost everyone was killed, and that was the flood. And that's why the second coming, Jesus always equated it. He said, like it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the coming of the Son of Man. God intervened the first time with water, the second time with Christ's second coming, and with fire as he reconstitutes the earth as a part of his plan. Well, basically, in verse 21, Jesus describes the tribulation as the final global holocaust. He's sitting, as you remember, on the side of the Mount of Olives. He's looking at the most visible representation of Judaism, of, of the worship of the true God. If you read anything about history and Herod's temple, Herod took the, the reconstruction of the Salmonic temple that was done by Zerubbabel, and he enlarges it immensely. Herod, the king, as in the baby-killing, magi-visited king of, of Israel at the time of Christ's birth, was actually just a, a grandiose builder. He always built to defy nature. Uh, he, he built a palace out into the ocean, into the Mediterranean Sea. He built his own peninsula, put it out there so he could have his boat come in, no one could see him, and he had a freshwater, gigantic, Olympic-sized swimming pool out in the ocean. I mean, he was against nature. He built another mountain uh, uh, 
perched palace right on the edge of a mountain that had had natural air conditioning. It was built over the Dead Sea, but because of the convection currents of evaporation and and the whole uh, way that, that the water would evaporate and rise with the desert breeze, it was naturally in the middle of 120 degrees, always 72 degrees, because he built it out where the, the sweeping rise of the air would be, and that, that was called Masada. He built his own mountain, uh, all kinds of stuff, but the temple was the greatest of all. The temple that, that Jesus is looking at in Matthew 24, the first three verses, was built on this incredible 40-acre platform that has the single largest building blocks that, that we know of in the world. There are some paralleling it north of there, but they are the largest. They're 475 metric tons each. And when groups go through there and walk next to them, you can take your credit card out, and you can't get your credit card between any of the places where the blocks meet. They are so tightly laid together. In spite of the fact they're 60 feet long and, and 15 feet Uh, deep and and about 12 feet high of solid stone, those gigantic stones, you can't can't get hardly a jackknife between them. But on top of all that building, he covered it with gold and all the votive offerings of the Jews. And so when Jesus sat there, it was probably blinding the light of the sun against this glittering gold and white limestone temple. And he starts talking about the tribulation from that, the end of the world from that setting. And what he describes is that humanity is just coming on to extinction because the tribulation, God takes back his restraint. Remember it says the one who restrains will be pulled back, the Holy Spirit who, who restrains evil in this world because of the church being here and because we're going forth with the light of the gospel. There's a restraining influence on the world. It's not as bad as it could be. But when he pulls out that restraining influence, the restrainer, the world begins to be as evil as it was at the time of the flood, where every imagination of man's heart, Genesis 6, 5, was only evil continually, it gets that way again. And and humanity begins to destroy humanity, and God's judgments begin to be poured out on the evil, and that combination makes it like the final apocalypse. What's amazing is that we believe And the Bible convinces us that we will not be here during the time of the great wrath of God. That's what the harpazo, the Greek word rapture, is a Latin word, rapturas. But the Greek word is harpazo, which is like harpoon, and it's like being snatched out. It's like something that falls in the fire and you you, you know, grab it out of there. That's the word for the rapture, because he's keeping us from the time of his wrath. But the amazing thing for us Americans is, we think that means we're not going to go through any tribulations, hardly at all. And what is happening, if, if you study closely, the, the setting of Matthew 24 is going to be already going in the world, and we're going to be here, and there's going to be great persecution of believers before the Lord takes us out, because there's going to be hatred and animosity, and then he's going to take us out. So that's just the setting as we prepare to survive the storms before the final storm. Well, Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22, for the third time tonight. Let's stand up, okay? And uh, you won't have to stand up anymore. You can just sit, stay all night if you want. But Matthew 24, uh, follow along as I read, and then we'll pray. Jesus said this, For then there will be great tribulation, such has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. This is the final, ultimate, greatest holocaust. Here is the key for the second coming. And unless those days were shortened, King James cut short, unless those days were were stopped by the Lord, by His coming, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Wow. The purpose of the second coming is to cut short those days, so that every human being doesn't die on this planet. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Father, open our eyes. Help us to be overwhelmed by the, the wonder that you are coming again, that you are going to judge this planet and you're going to cut short the judgment so that there are still people left to people the millennial kingdom on this world. Thank you for your great plan. And as we march through all these big events on your calendar, may it be more than a mental exercise, more than facts, more than getting the pieces put together. May our hearts be stirred 
to be expectant of your coming, to be grateful, and to learn the lessons that we need to know to prepare for the storms that are going to be before the great storm, to be those who are godly that will suffer persecution, as Paul said. Thank you. Open our eyes. Teach us tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And I'd like to just take a moment to compare the events. Sometimes when you read, in just a little while we're going to read about the revelation or about the tribulation, but sometimes when you read that, it just kind of gets into a blur. It's almost like when you hear too many statistics. You ever heard so many statistics, it just finally it just goes right by you? The details of the tribulation are like that. There's so many one-third and one-half and one-quarter and, you know, one-sixth and all this stuff that's going on. It just kind of goes right by us. So let's take a modern event, 60 years, 63 years ago. Let's look at something that happened in our world that almost everyone has some, some exposure to and use that to illustrate what the tribulation and what I'm talking about is three years ago across the world dignitaries marked the 60th anniversary of the liberation of the grisly World War II era death camp complex called Auschwitz. Now you probably all have heard of Auschwitz and Hitler's final solution. Hitler's Holocaust, horrible as it was, murdering over six million Jews alone pales when compared to the tribulation. In other words, what Hitler did is nothing. It was horrible. It was significant. It's nothing compared to what's coming. If you ever study the Holocaust, you recognize images of what are most often used to remind us of the final solution, Hitler's genocide. Briefly, here's what Auschwitz speaks of. About a million and a half people. Now, remember, there were death camps. There was Dachau and Treblinka and all these other ones. This was just the biggest one. Uh, it was a, a massive... Uh, 40 square kilometer place that was completely constructed to kill people. And so it was, it was uh, the one we talk about the most. But one and a half million people died in Auschwitz, of whom 1.2 million were Jews. We have to never forget, he wasn't just killing, Hitler wasn't just killing Jews, he was killing other people too. The maimed, the mentally disabled, gypsies, other outcasts, anybody that they didn't like, they would exterminate and send to Auschwitz and other places. That means one-fifth of all the six million Jews exterminated by Hitler died in this one complex. Other groups of people who died included Polish political prisoners, Soviet prisoners, gypsies, people with disabilities, prisoners of conscience, and even of religious faith, as you've probably uh, heard about with uh, some of those who who wrote and uh, were executed because of their faith in Christ. This complex was three camps, 36 subcamps, all built inside this Polish town on an isolated 40 square kilometer site, and that was constructed between the years 40 and 42 of the last century. When you trace World War II's Holocaust history, what's amazing is it parallels the tribulation. Now, let me share with you what I mean. Most scholars see the first half of the seven final year period called the tribulation in Earth's history to be relatively normal. Uh, In other words, there's going to be uh, a lot of just enhancement of terrible things going on. There'll be more earthquakes and more famines and more pestilences. But it appears in the record that it's at the three and a half year mark that the Lord pours out what he calls the great tribulation. That's why there's a whole group in Christendom that are called mid-tribbers. They they believe they're staying in until the halfway point. And then there's a whole group like the person interviewed me at Moody Radio that at the end of the interview, they said, by the way, I'm a post-tribber. Don't agree with you at all. And I said, well, praise the Lord. Thank you. Glad you're saved. You know, are you sure you are? Uh, since you're going to go through so much. Uh, but um, uh, the first three and a half years are relatively normal. But the second half seems to have the incredible destruction, the demon armies, and death. So in Bible terms, the great tribulation lasts three and a half years. Or as it's known in the Bible, 42 months or as it's also known in the Bible, 1,260 days. There are all these different designations for it. Amazingly, Auschwitz opened its doors to death by gas chamber on September 3, 1941. It was liberated by the Soviet army on the 27th of January in 1945. So Auschwitz, the death camp of the Holocaust, only operated for 42 months. So there's a great comparison. If you've ever heard of Auschwitz and death camps, it lasted for 42 months, three and a half years, as long as the Great Tribulation. So we have a little kind of a point of reference. 
The death camp of Auschwitz and the death camp of the Great Tribulation are almost the exact same length of time, but that's the only comparison that's similar for this reason. In the tribulation, one half minimum of all people die. If you read, and we're going to read Revelation 6 momentarily. In the verses it says, if you add it up, half of all humanity dies. How many people? Well, today I looked at the, at the population, the world population clock, and it says there are 6,726,400,000 and some thousand people alive on earth right now. So 6.74 billion people. One half of those people, or 3.350 plus change, are going to, so three and one third billion people will die in three and a half years. The Bible says that the three and a half years are 1,260 days, 42 months. That means that 2.6 million people have to die every day. All of Auschwitz was only 1.5 over the whole period of time. Twice that many have to die every day during the tribulation. Do you know what that works out to? It works out to 200,000 people an hour for 16 hours a day. Do you remember the, the great tsunami of 2004? Were you around Christmas of 04 and watching TV as those waves, that, you know, that eight point whatever magnitude quake and those huge waves came and just, you, they kept playing it over and over as it showed it washing up and washing people away and they were holding on to things. In the end, over 200,000 people died in that one tsunami of 04. Imagine a tsunami every hour somewhere on the planet, 16 hours a day, for three and a half years. That's how big the tribulation is. You know what? I wonder how are they going to bury those people? How? It's just unbelievable the amount of death that God says is going on in this planet. The final holocaust is so terrifying, so deadly, so inescapable that Matthew 24, 21 and 22 says God personally stops it lest no humans be alive. It's going that fast. Now, Matthew 24 tells us that the end of everyone's life as it was is what the tribulation is going to be like. Life is not going to go on as normal. Time stops. Lives begin to end. Nothing is ever the same again. Now, when is this event? Well, let me back up because uh, we started last week and some of you started writing this down. The last event in God's prophetic calendar is heaven. And that's in Revelation 21 and 22. Heaven tells us we should be investing by laying up treasures in heaven. And I asked you last week and I ask you again this week, how much have you already sent into your account? Everybody's measuring their 401s and 403s and everything else because of the, everything that's going on in the world financial markets. And everybody knows exactly how much decline they have and they've checked and they're moving stuff around. How are you doing and how am I doing at moving stuff to heaven? where there is no financial meltdown, where no one can steal it, where you don't even have to pay taxes on it, where it's just kept, and where you get a hundredfold, a 10,000% return on all that you send ahead. How are you doing at sending ahead? That's heaven. That's the seventh event. The sixth event is the great white throne. Judgment. That's in Revelation 20, the, the last half. And the lesson of that is be faithful by pointing people to Christ. We should be faithful. We should be faithful to share the gospel. We should be faithful to to be alert. I just talked to a couple this morning that were sitting in an airport waiting for a plane, and and the person next to them started sobbing in the seat next to them uh, in the waiting area, and and they said started talking about someone dying. And when they got off the phone, they came to them and said, "Could could we minister to you?" And they shared the gospel with them. You know, we should be always alert because the people around us without Christ are headed to the lake of fire. The fifth event is the millennium that's backing up, 7, 6, 5. It's be focused. That's the first ten verses of, of Revelation. And we should be focused because only Christ will perfect the earth. Now we have another election coming. and We should all be involved. We should vote. We should be up to speed. We should know what's going on. In fact, the week before the election, I'm going to give you my complete political views. And uh, you'll, you'll be interested. I'm pro-life, pro-work, uh, pro-capital punishment, uh, you know, right, right down the line, where the Bible is. And so you should use the truth to examine the candidates and see how close you can get to that in your voting. 
But we're not going to save America politically, and we're not going to save the world ecologically. We should be focused. Only Christ will perfect the earth. Now let's turn to Revelation 19, because I want you to look at the fourth event. And if you're writing in your Bible, the fourth of the seven big events, and I actually write these at the top of the page in my Bible, like this, see, all of you can see there. Uh, you know, because every time I read the Bible, it reminds me of those seven events or whatever else. I always take notes in my Bible. The older you get, you need little reminders. But the second coming of Christ is the fourth event. And, and the lesson of it is be patient, for only Christ will right all wrongs. You remember, there are people that, that murder people and never get caught. There are people that steal uh, widows' fortunes and they never get taught. I was talking to a businessman this week, and he said he invested in Savannah, Georgia, in this retirement center, put his life savings in building this thing, and, a, and this big business group came in, and they took the escrow money, and he's still litigating in court, and his life savings are gone, and it might take years to get it in court. And you know what I thought? There's a lot of injustice in the world. There's a lot of inequities, inequalities. There's a lot of prejudice. There's a lot of discrimination. There's a lot of horrific crimes. But the second coming is be patient. Only Christ will right all wrongs. There's a day coming, a day of reckoning, when Jesus returns and no one can escape and no one will be able to to legally find a loophole and get out of it. And that is what the second coming is all about, that Jesus comes and says, enough, it's time. Start in chapter 19 and follow along with me. I'm going to read to you the wonders of the second coming. This is what it says. After these things, I heard a loud voice and a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, which, by the way, is an imperative, and it means to let God be praised. Not, not hopefully that God be praised, but it's the most repeated positive command in the Bible, to praise God, hallelujah or alleluia. And then it says, Salvation and glory and honor and power now belong to the Lord our God. This is one of the doxologies of Revelation. It has four parts. Remember, some are three, some are four, some are seven. This one has four parts. Salvation, glory, honor, and power belong to the Lord. It's a fourfold doxology. For true and righteous are his judgments. See, he's the one that's going to right all wrongs. Because he judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again they said, Alleluia. Her smoke rises up forever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Now, I like that fourth verse because it means that they're a little baptistic in heaven. Did you catch that? Amen? 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 Yeah, yeah. You ought to pastor in the South. I pastored in the South, and especially you go to a black church, you have to learn to pause between everything. You go, the Lord said, they go, Hallelujah. And they say, the Lord said, Amen. And you just learn to go along with the flow because they are getting ready for heaven. Because look what happens right here in verse 4. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes we're a little sedate. And we're going to not be sedate in heaven. We're going to be praising and falling down before the throne. And I remember preaching through the book of Revelation many years ago. And one of our oldest elders, white-haired, he said, you know what? If it wouldn't bother people around me, he said, I would have gotten down on my knees in the aisle and worship the Lord. But we don't do that in our kind of church. That's reserved for the charismatic people, he said. So I won't do it, but I'm doing it in my heart. And I thought, oh, we should be careful, right? We should be careful about having customs that keep us from worshiping the Lord. And so don't be disruptive, but if the Lord gets a hold of your heart, you can do anything that won't disturb people, and you can just worship God the Lord. Because forever, when it gets to a crescendo, look what it says in verse 4. The 24 elders, that's the the representatives, it's the priesthood representatives, it represents the people of God, both Old and New Testament. They hop off those little thrones they're on and just fall down on their faces before the Lord. They are so overwhelmed at how great He is. And they humble themselves and they cast their crowns at His feet because He alone is worthy. Verse 5, And a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude. This is, the, by the way, the prep for the second coming. Jesus hasn't even come yet, and they're getting all stirred up in heaven for the second coming event. 
The voice of a great multitude, verse 6. The sound of many waters, the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready, and to her was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. We don't have time to go in that tonight, but it appears that we wear forever what we were for God on earth. And it means that what you did here, energized by God's grace, will matter forever. We have little inklings of this. In Daniel 12, it says those who turn many to righteousness, those who are involved in discipling, those who are involved in leading people to Christ and nurturing them in Christ at every level, those who turn many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. Do you know what that means? Those who don't turn many to righteousness will not shine like the stars forever. Do you understand? God says what you do in your body matters forever. He wipes away all the sins. He erases the record, puts the penalty on Christ. That's the negative is gone. He clothes us with his righteousness, but his grace is always available to energize us to redeem time for eternal benefit, for eternal good, for works that last forever. And there's a little indication in this eighth verse that that the saints that are all hallelujahing around the throne are arrayed in the righteous acts they did as saints on earth. It has nothing to do with their salvation. It's because they were saved they acted that way. So there are going to be people that are going to be sad in heaven, and that's why God has to wipe away their tears, because they are saved so as by fire. We had a rental home once that burned, and the lady that started the, was smoking in bed and started the house on fire She actually got burnt, and she ran out of the house, didn't even get her purse. She was wearing her nightgown, and she smelled like smoke, and she got burned by the fire. Do you know what? That's being saved, so as by fire. It's losing everything, but you make it. People, Some people will get to heaven, yet so as by fire, Paul said. That means that they were saved, but they wasted their lives. They frittered them away. In stuff that wasn't sin, it just didn't last forever. They didn't redeem any time. So it's something to think about. Verse 9, Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, See that you don't do it. This is an angel talking. I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Don't worship people. Don't fall at feet. Of people, remember Peter had the same thing when when uh, Cornelius came and he started falling his feet and he said, "No, no, no, no! Don't do that! Don't do that! Don't worship! I'm normal! Don't worship me!" And that's that's something that we need to be very careful to worship God, not His servants. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And now here comes the second coming after this build up. Verse 11, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And his eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written what no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now now that fine linen, white and clean, if you back up, and you notice it says the same thing, in verse 8, in fine linen, clean and bright. And so it appears that we are right behind him. The saints, we're coming with him. It's the armies, actually, is the word hosts. And so uh, that's, that's why I say everybody gets to go to the Holy Land. Either you go here uh, while you're alive or, or Jesus takes you. But it's so important, everybody gets to go. And so they follow him on white horses. And verse 15, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And then the whole Armageddon thing. That's the second coming. 
Jesus rights all wrongs. The absolute security that Jesus will come and intervene in human history. He will break through the skies. Every eye will see him and people will mourn when they see him. And they will be looking for rocks to hide under. They'll look for caves to jump in. They know the judge has come. Amazing. Christ's second coming. Be patient for only Christ will right all wrongs. Back up to chapter 6 of Revelation. And real quickly, I want to show you the third event. And if you're a Bible marker, the third event, and we're just surveying these. We could go uh, at great length on the second coming. The second coming is described in detail. In Isaiah 24, it's, it's described in detail. In Zechariah 12, 13, and 14, it's described in detail in places in the Gospels, but, and, and most right here in Revelation. But, but now the third event, the fourth, the second coming, the third is the tribulation, And the tribulation, the lesson from the tribulation is be thankful because Christ has promised to keep us from his time of great wrath. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, God has not appointed us, Paul was speaking of the church, to wrath. God has not appointed us to have to endure his wrath on this planet. Remember, the last time God cataclysmically intervened was the flood. Do you remember the details of the flood? Someone got taken out before the flood. Do you remember who that was? Who walked with God? Enoch. Enoch is a beautiful Old Testament picture of the church. He walked with God, and the time came, and the Lord took him, and he was gone. Then Noah and his family went through the flood, and they were protected inside that ark of safety. you know what that's a beautiful picture of? The Jewish people who God will keep through the tribulation. They will be sought out to be annihilated once and for all. And the Lord surrounds them. He does all kinds of things. He protects them. He even opens up the earth and the armies are swallowed and he protects his people. Do you remember the third group in the flood? Enoch got out ahead of time. Noah got through it. Everyone else got drowned. Okay? Same thing with the final cataclysmic. God takes the church like Enoch out, preserves Israel and, and those who are serving, those saints that are the 144,000 evangelists from Israel, as well as the two witnesses. He preserves them, the witnesses up until a certain point, and then in chapter 11 they are taken to heaven after they're killed. But God preserves them through the tribulation, but then everybody else is subject to his wrath and they're dying Rapidly, half of all the people die. The tribulation for us who know Christ should remind us that he has kept us from the time of his great wrath. But look at chapter 6, and I just want to uh, just survey this because this is what I want to share with you this evening, the, the lessons of the final Holocaust. Uh, first, we see that it, it, the, the book of Revelation is kind of like an unfolding flower. It's one flower, but it just keeps opening, kind of like the petals, and it keeps getting more intricate and complex. And, and there are all these seals and bowls and vials and, and trumpets and all this stuff, and then there's interludes, and it's a very complex structure. It's all heptatic. It's built around sevens, and, and there's a lot of stuff in here. But, but look at the seals with me. This is the thumbnail sketch of the tribulation and by the way this exactly parallels matthew 24 you want to do a study look at the the revelation 6 matthew 24 correspondence it's unbelievable but the same author wrote it all that's why it's so good but verse 1 of chapter 6 i saw the and the lamb opened one of the seals and i heard one of the four living creatures remember these cherubims that are always facing god and one of them saying with a voice like thunder come and see And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given him, and he went out to conquer, conquering and to conquer. Now remember, white horse, this is a, remember Jesus in chapter 19 comes on the white horse, and early on people go, oh, this is Jesus, you know, coming. No, no, this is the anti-Jesus, the anti-Christ. He's coming, the false uh, conqueror that uh, isn't bringing peace, the false peace. Then the second seal uh, verse 3, when he opened the seal, I heard a second living creature saying, Come and see, and another horse was fiery red, and was granted to one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given him a great sword. So this is death and, and warfare and murder. Verse 5, he opened the third seal, and I heard the third living creature say, Come and see, and look, behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales. And of course, this is the famine, global famine coming. 
And it says, uh, uh, a voice in the midst of the four creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius. A quart of wheat for a denarius. Denarius was a day's pay. So, so they are just surviving. They can just barely uh, get by. It's like you work all day and you just get enough to, to have food. And three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and wine. So there seems to be this luxury during the tribulation. People are still living in luxury. Uh, verse 7, the fourth seal. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come and see. And I looked and behold... A pale horse. The pale, it's like chloros. It's like chlorine gas. It's kind of thick green, kind of the color of bile. You know, it's just awful. Uh, this, it's, it's horrible. And, and this is uh, the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger. So, so this warfare we already saw in the previous seal, Hunger, we also saw in the previous seal, with death, but this is the fascinating one, and by the beasts of the earth. So in this seal, a fourth of 6.7 currently billion people die through these various means, through murder, the sword, warfare, uh, hunger, famine, death, and the beasts of the earth. You know, all of them are easy except the beasts. And you know what's amazing? When we think of beasts, we think of... Uh, cougars and lions and, you know, and tigers and, and I don't know what ferocious beasts we have here. Uh, wolverines, I guess, uh, in Michigan, the Wolverine State. But that's not what it is. Uh, if you look at the background of this word in the Greek language, um, uh, Anton von Leeuwenhoek, the microscope guy, when he first looked in a microscope at a little bit of water from a pond, do you remember his, his amazing words? He said, behold, what manner of beasties. He called those little microscopic organisms beasts. You know, most likely this, this death from beast is not that the Lord... He could, but I don't think he ramps up the lion population and the snake population. It's probably what we would call biological warfare. It's probably the, the biological agents that are being amassed all over the world by terrorist groups. You know, you ever thought about once they let the genie out of the bottle, what's going to happen? I think about that with all this genetic work they're doing. They're mutating and, and changing everything. And, and what we really don't know is once you start doing genetic changes, what happens? What happens when, when things, I say the kids, uh, especially like some of this mutated stuff that they make into corn chips and everything else, I said, that never exists. God didn't make that. That's been so altered, you know. Uh, what's the long-term effect in the human body of all this stuff? We don't know, but we do know this, that beasts of the earth and all the rest kill a fourth. And then on, the martyrs cry. And then verse 12 onward talks about huge things, the, the cosmic earthquake that's going on. And then we get into 144,000. That's the tribulation. Now, quickly before we go, let me summarize this. In the Great Tribulation, what we just read in chapter 6, these are staggering numbers. Now, don't get buzzed by numbers, but just think of them. More than 2.5 million people die every day for 42 months. More than 2.5 million people. What's the population of Michigan these days? Isn't it 7, 8, 9 million? I don't know what it is. Maybe it's more. I haven't kept track. But Michigan be wiped out in three or four days. Everybody in the whole state during the tribulation. So Michigan would last four days, max. Gone. Everybody. In Auschwitz, 1,200 died every day. That means 2,500 times as many people as during the Holocaust die every day on earth. 2,500 times as many people. Or to put it in Auschwitz terms, the number of people that died every 24 hours at Auschwitz will die every 30 seconds in the Great Tribulation. That means you have an Auschwitz every 30 seconds going on all day long. In other terms, living on earth will be like living in an Auschwitz death camp. And in the death tolls, there will be the equivalent of a holocaust twice a day for 42 months. A brief look through the pages of Revelation, chapter 6, if we had time to look at 8, 9, and 16, describe a living hell that can only be avoided by salvation. Now think of a summary of the tribulation. Here are the dreadful disasters. Number one, one out of every two people will die. Look at chapter 6, verse 8. Right there is a fourth. Now add up all the other ones, and that's why, conservatively speaking, half, probably more. 
Probably more because Jesus said in Matthew 24, 21 that if he didn't stop this thing, no one would be left. And I don't think half is no one. Uh, you know, so it appears Jesus doesn't exaggerate. And he says, if I didn't intervene, no one would be left. And so it seems to be a, a high percentage of human population. So whether by death that comes instantly and thus less dreaded or a slow and painful death that is lingering and agonizing, 50% of all people will die. That amounts to 11 times the current population of the United States will die during the tribulation. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the people that make up our great land 11 times over finding graves for all those people? So remember, the population of the world doubles in less than 39 years right now. So as long as it takes before the Lord comes, every day the number of people becomes larger and larger. But not only that, number two, not only half of all the people, one-third of all plant life will be burned up. Grass, trees, everything green slowly gets destroyed. Look at chapter 8, verse 7. Do you remember uh, when I was a little boy, there was the, the elm thing that went through. Do you remember all those elm trees? They were just cutting them down everywhere. And we've had many of these little blights that go through. There's something going through the oaks in the north. And I remember at Camp Barrico, they were pointing out the ones that had the oak disease. Can you imagine one out of every three of everything, every blade in your grass, in your lawn, every flower, every tree around you, every third one just gone in one climactic set of circumstances? It says in chapter 8, verse 7, the first angel, now, these, now we're in the trumpets, we've already gone through these seals, and the trumpets, you notice that, that it's like a flower opening. After we go through the seals, the seventh seal is the start of the first trumpet. And so the flower is opening up more and more, and you're seeing more and more detail. And so this, this uh, first trumpet in verse 7 of chapter 8, it says, The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. All green grass. You know, we live in, we're renting in Woodbridge. I mean, that is like the lawn capital. I mean, everybody just has like a golf course lawn. I mean, Bonnie and I went for, they don't have that in Oklahoma. We were just, I actually took my shoes off and I was going, whoa, it's just like carpet. It's so nice. I wonder how much their watering bill is. Because, you know, it's real dry in Oklahoma. Can you imagine all green grass? Do you know what the effect's going to be on the air quality when we don't have all of the, the work on the CO2 out of our, of our atmosphere by the, the photosynthetic work of green plants, and one-third of all the trees and all grass will be destroyed. Thirdly, look at verse 12. Not only do half of all the people minimum and a third of all the vegetation, but the sun and moon are darkened as nature goes into revolt. It says in verse 12 that the fourth angel sounds, and a third of the sun and a third of the moon and a third of the stars were struck so the third of them would be darkened and the day would not shine for a third of it and the night would be the same way. Remember last week our missionary was talking about the sun never got higher than just at the treetops and how dim it was? You know, alcoholism is rampant in Russia because it's dark so much in the north. Iceland is almost the alcoholic capital of the world because they always are in the dark. And people are very discouraged when it's dark. People like sunlight. They like... I heard it's like that here, too. February, someone told me that. They said, everybody leaves in February, it gets so dark. Well, can you imagine where you can't leave and go to Florida or wherever? The whole earth just kind of is like twilight. And, and it's like, what happened to the sun? What happened to the moon? It's just, it's not shining. That's another part. The sun and moon are darkened. By the way, the, the converse happens, too. The sun cranks up seven times. You know, now you put on a little SPF, whatever, and you keep from getting skin cancer. Can you imagine having seven times the power of the sun? You know, you go out and you can start feeling heat, especially if you don't have any thatch on top. You can really feel it fast. Can you imagine if the sun was seven times hotter? That's what it says in Revelation and also in the Minor Prophets, that the sun scorches the earth. And then look at chapter 9. Turn over the page real quickly. Chapter 9 of Revelation. Fourthly, not only do half plus of all the people, one-third plus of all the vegetation in one event is burned up, the sun and moon dim by 30%. But fourthly, and this is, this is amazing, the gates of the pit. Now we can say the gates of hell, but really nobody's in hell right now, but, but that's a good metaphor for us. The gates of hell will open and hordes of locusts the size of horses. 
Uh, you know, locusts are pretty ugly. You ever have a little kid pick one up and poke it in your face at the bus stop, you know, and they're just, they look like monsters in those big, you know, things they have and squeeze them too hard and that green stuff comes out and everything. Can you imagine, can you imagine locusts the size of a horse? Can you imagine hordes of them with those, those things, those claws they have and those awful mouths they have that are the size of horses? Wow. And these locusts will be allowed, they also have something locusts don't have, they're allowed to sting people like scorpions, and the pain of one scorpion sting from these horse-sized locusts lasts for five months, and the Bible says that, that people will beg God to let them die. They're going to all be looking for Jack Kevorkian, you know, and his, his death machine, and God will not allow them to die. So for five months, there's a moratorium on death on the earth. And God allows people to feel the pain. Now you say, well, this sounds grotesque. Why on earth would God do this? Because you've got to read the rest of the book. Did you know the entire time that the tribulation's going on, God has 144,000 evangelists that speak every language of every person on the earth. And these 144,000, imagine Seth Kniep, supersized 144,000 times. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine what would happen? I mean, just... Energy, boundless energy, and, and, you know, passing out tracts and talking. 144,000 of them covering the whole planet, speaking every language of the world. That's the first thing. God has three layers of evangelism going on in the tribulation. You know, you've read too many Left Behind novels that, that says no one that heard the gospel, you know, will ever be able to be saved. The tribulation is actually the greatest influx of people coming to salvation of any period of time on earth. And it's because the 144,000 are doing their evangelistic work. The two witnesses are doing their witnessing work. And on top of that, it says in chapter 14 and verse 3 that God sends an angel. It's so bad, people are getting stung. The rocks are they're trying to hide under the rocks and caves, and the sun is scorching them, and, and, and they're starving to death, and there's no plant life, and the water is poisoned, and all that other stuff that happens. And during that time, an angel from God flies like a gospel blimp through the sky. And this angel flies over every part of the surface of the earth and preaches the gospel and says, repent, turn to God. Can you imagine how hard people's hearts are? Half of everyone is dying. Plants are dying. The oceans, everything in the seas starts dying, all the life. Water is all poisonous. Stuff's falling to earth. The ground's ripping open and these demon creatures are coming up with gigantic stingers and getting everybody. It sounds like a Stephen King novel, you know, or something like that. And can you imagine while all that's going on, God's sending the 144,000, the two, and this angel, and people still refuse. Don't feel bad if they won't listen to you. They wouldn't listen to Jesus. They wouldn't listen to his prophets. They wouldn't listen to the apostles. And when they are actually dying, like dropping like flies, and God the merciful is sending the angel preaching the gospel, they still won't listen. Amazing. Revelation chapter 9, look at verse 3. Then out of the smoke the locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as scorpions on the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing, or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God in their foreheads. Remember the, the seal of the devil, you know, the 666 thing on their foreheads and hands? God also, it says in Ezekiel, God seals us with an invisible seal. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And, and in Ezekiel it talks about the angel of God coming with a blotter and a pen and marking the foreheads of those who hate sin and those who love God. Not the people that go to church, not the people that say they're saved. Those who inside hate sin and love God. Did you know that seems to be an indication of salvation? You hate sin. Let everyone that names the name of Christ, what? Depart from iniquity. And love God with all of our heart. And those are sealed. And those uh, scorpions don't get those people who are sealed on their foreheads. Um, but they were not given authority to kill them, but torment them for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, but death will flee from them. So the fourth horror of the tribulation, half the people die, a third of the trees, sun and moon darkened, gates of hell open. Number five, worldwide famine. 
unlike anything the world has ever seen. That's in Revelation 6, 5 and 6, and Revelation, uh, if you want to keep going to the right, look at 18, uh, Revelation 18:8. 18, Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine. Revelation 18:8. 8. There seems to be a disruption of the food supply. Now you all know that you know they're running out of gas in Nashville and Atlanta, and there's a big run on gas and this past week in South Carolina and North Carolina and everywhere else. And, and it, you know, they're, they're rationing gas and they want all the commuters to get it and the buses and, and the emergency vehicles and all that. Can you imagine the tribulation, how hard it's going to be to get food around? Would you drive your Gordon Food Service truck if those horse things were stinging? Are you kidding? Park the truck and hide. And there's going to be a famine over the earth because we're so dependent on food traveling around. So there'll be a worldwide famine. And number six, uh, if you want to back up to Revelation 14 and verse 20, and I'm almost done, uh, Revelation 14, 20, the sixth element of the tribulation will be there will be a world war so bloody that the blood of those killed in battle will flow in a stream for 200 miles, splashing up to the height of the bridle of a horse. It doesn't mean that blood is this deep. There's not enough blood to get blood that's, five feet deep for 200 miles. There just isn't enough. But what it's saying is blood to a horse's bridle. If you know anything, if you've ever been in an accident scene, it seems like blood just, whoa, it just spreads easily. And this is talking about so many people are killed that for 200 miles, everywhere that you go, it just, it splatters, kind of like mud, only it's blood going everywhere for 200 miles around this battlefield. And that's the Battle of Armageddon. Chapter 14, verse 20. And the wine press was trampled outside the city, and the blood came out of the wine press up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. So that is about 200 miles. Blood will splash to the height of a horse's bridle. And all told, during the Great Tribulation, more than half of all the people on the earth will be killed. Now do you see why God calls the rapture the blessed what? Hope of the believers. Now do you see why 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says God has not appointed us to wrath? God has a group of people that are going to go through the tribulation and they are clearly talked about in Matthew 24, Revelation 7, and Revelation 14 and those are his witnesses. But he pulls out his church so that Israel can come to the forefront and become the evangelist to the world, a light to the nations, and his chosen people of promise that endure the great horrors of the tribulation. Well, that leads us to the second event where we're going to pick up next time, Lord willing. And it's probably the biggest of all these events because all of us have an appointment. While all this is going on, while God is burning the grass and the trees and souring the water, something else is going on. And it's each one of us individually having an appointment to stand in front of God clothed in what we were on earth. You know what? He hasn't come and gotten you yet. Do you know what you're going to wear in heaven? What righteous deeds are you doing in His name this week that will last forever? Think about that as you sit down and watch the game. As you sit down and fritter away in hobbies that you don't even know what to do with all the stuff you're making. Look at all that stuff and say, this is good, it's relaxing, but is it going to last forever? And try and spend more and more proportion of your time this week learning about the God who loves you and revealed himself and learning what he says we can do that will never pass away. Amen? Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Thank you for telling us the end from the beginning. Thank you for letting us see the, the conclusion to the story. And it's awful. And everything that people spend their lives for is going to all burn up and get destroyed and become worthless. But you've told us now, so we know how to convert our time, our frail momentary time on earth, into what will never pass away. You've told us that that comes by us sacrificing our pleasures for your kingdom, by us doing in secret what only you see and you'll reward us openly, by us sharing the gospel and taking people with us to heaven, 
by us sacrificially giving our resources and not laying them up on earth and stacking them where they're going to corrode and rust and get stolen, but stacking them up in heaven. I pray that this little glimpse into the final Holocaust will stir our hearts to seek you and serve you all of our days. And we'll thank you for what you do. By your grace as you energize us in the precious name of Jesus and for your glory we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.